Climate change will cause more extreme storms, floods, droughts, and heat waves. And most importantly, they will be in places that we haven't expected them to occur and therefore not prepared for them. As somebody once said to me, a hurricane in Antarctica, if it ever occurred, nobody cares about because nobody's there. It is where natural disasters or wet, extreme weather actually imposes on people that we then have a crisis that we need to deal with. Right, so climate change may also lead to uh, more floods, uh, sorry, more food and water insecurity. And I put may there because I'm going to talk about those systems later. And it may lead to migration and conflict. There is a lot of literature out there that says, oh yes, climate change will lead to conflict. What I find fascinating is when the UN looks into this, you find that when you have major problems with water resources, people usually work together to solve it. So this one at the bottom, you must have a caveat. So, this is all because we have too many people on the planet. And I, I put this... <laughs> I put this cartoon up, or so this uh, picture up, uh, not to shock you by the 1970s dress, okay, but to say that population brings out the worst in people. It's the same hysteria that I get when I talk about climate change. So I want to actually put some things to rest about population. So the first thing is, how comes we have such a large global population? It's called the demographic transition. So we start off, we have uh, sort of... Uh, pre-industrial sort of societies where we have high birth rates. So women may be having six to eight children and maybe only two of them are surviving to adulthood and it's because of the high mortality. Now, particularly post-Second World War, the revolution uh, of medicine in the 1950s, uh, medicine and development, and particularly uh, the growth of vaccines, meant that those children survived to adulthood. So what we have is we have high fertility, but we have low mortality. Those children are surviving to adulthood. So population grows rapidly. We then, and this is the next step, education comes along, and particularly women's education up to secondary school level, which allows women's empowerment and they take control of their own fertility. I know this is a shock to many of the men watching and in the audience. We actually do not control how many children we have. We think we do, we don't. And we've shown this time and time again that women empowerment, and it's interesting because when children start to become expensive, and instead of actually being useful for working in the fields, they become expensive and you have to send them to college. Yeah, you don't have as many. And it's a wonderful thing which is across all societies. It doesn't matter about the religious base or anything like that. You educate women, the population stabilizes. Okay? So you then have low fertility, low mortality, and population growth. This is the rate that population has grown over the last 300 years. That peak is in the 1960s. It's 2% growth in the global population every year. From 1950 to today, we doubled the world's population. We went from 3.5 billion people to 7 billion people. There's an extra 3.5 billion people in the world. And as you can see, we're now on this downward trend. The blue curve is most likely. And by the end of this century, we're probably going to have some shrinkage of the global population because of that move to low fertility. Is this population distributed evenly around the world? Well, no. As you can see, China, India, as you would expect. But look at the UK, look at France, look at Germany. And in Africa, it's dominated by Ethiopia and Nigeria. And in of course, the north, you can see the United States has a burgeoning population. So what does the UN predict for the future? Well, they suggest that we've now hit 7 billion people, and we're probably going to have 10 billion people by the middle of the century, and then it may tail off. Now, for me, this will only occur if we continue to fund family planning around the world. One of the key things that President Obama did when he came into office, it was almost one of the first things he did, was he actually removed the gag law from UN funding. 
The previous administration had not allowed any funding to the UN to be spent on family planning. Okay? Obama removed this straight away so we can try to catch up on the lost 25 years to help countries educate uh, their population and help them with family planning. So what are we looking at? So we're looking at population, could be 10 billion by the middle of the century. We have rapid development because everybody wants to be an American. And we also have temperature rises of perhaps over 4 degrees. But are, is everyone equally to blame? Is it because everybody is causing this problem? Well, there's always been this simplistic link. So this is the equation. People only see the first two bits. Ah, CO2 people. Oh, if you have more people, more CO2, so let's have less people. It doesn't quite work like that because, of course, people, how many services do you have per person? How much energy does each service use? And how much CO2 does each service produce? So, for example, if you had all your electricity produced from renewable sources with no CO2, that equation would be zero. So it doesn't matter how many people you have. So to remind you of the challenge, okay? Okay, so I'm, I'm into challenges, okay? And opportunities. This is the challenge for the future. This is the business as usual on red. The Annex 1 countries, I apologize for the strange terminology, those are the rich countries, okay? Those are the OECD countries such as here, Europe, Japan, Australia. The non-Annex countries are the developing countries. And the blue curve is where we need to go if we're going to keep the temperature to less than 2 degrees. Now, even if I click my fingers magically and the US and Europe stop producing greenhouse gases now. Oh, it didn't happen, sorry. <laughs> Again, what would happen? The problem here is, even if you remove the dark yellow, the Annex 1, the developing countries, would already pass that curve by 2040. So this is why it's a political uh, discussion, because we need the rapidly developing countries like China and India and Brazil and South Africa to engage and reduce their actual emissions as well. 